Have you tried turning it off and on again? This is the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. Presented by IJMBooks.com. Hey, kids, welcome back for another exciting edition of the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. I am your host, as always, Ian J. Malone, joined by my buddies Scott Esther and Dave Daniels. Going to get to them here in just a second, but before we do, you know the list of stuff we are online dudesinhyperspace.com. If you got questions about the show, maybe even interested in purchasing yourself a little bit of swag or becoming a sponsor, that's where you can find information to do that. We're also doing the social media thing via Facebook with our Dudes in Hyperspace podcast group and our Twitter handle at the Hyper Dudes. Finally, if you want to contact us via email, there's a contact form on the site or you can just straight up do it at dudesinhyperspace at gmail.com. I've been teasing a lot on social media the last few days that we had a very, very, very special guest coming on the show tonight. And uh, that was all fine and good until the weather in Dallas-Fort Worth decided to take a dump on all of that. As we record right now, the NASCAR Cup Series is uh, nearing the end of Stage 2 of an event that was supposed to run on Sunday. Um... And the person that we were going to interview tonight is kind of on track right now, busy earning a living. So uh, we're supposed to be lining up for some time in the next week. I'll keep you guys posted on that as that unfolds. But uh, when you're dealing with people that have that kind of schedule, you just got to roll with the punches. But we just appreciate them taking their time to talk to us, and we're looking forward to that conversation when it happens. Uh, In the meantime, we're going to do a little bit of a different uh, approach this evening. We got your dude mail questions coming up in a little while, uh, which we always enjoy getting to. But uh, in light of the fact that this was kind of a short-notice deal, uh, and there's not a huge not a ton going on in terms of major headlines. Um, we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. Uh, before I get into that, though, let me welcome in my guys, Dave Daniels, Scott Esther. How are we doing this evening, fellas? Doing well, sir. Uh, I will say, though, don't they have in-car communications that they can just patch him through? We can ask a couple of questions. You hear the car going around, and then we can just be done with this? You know, s- sadly, it is a little bit more complicated than that. Although, uh, there have been uh, instances back in the day when people found out the frequency that the driver was on and I don't know how they pulled it off, but they managed to get onto the actual radio during the event. So you hear guys going, go get him, Dale. We're, we're going to need a better producer, right, Scott? Exactly. <laughs> I was just disappointed. He didn't ask us to be a spotter for the race. We could have done it from, uh, from the couch. Yeah, there you go. No, it's uh, again, it's a, uh, there's a bit more to it than that. And I'll be straight up honest with you. One of the reasons I'm really looking forward to talking to this person is because I want you guys and for our listeners to hear firsthand just how far off base so many of the stigmas are about racing. Just the whole notion that these guys aren't athletes, that they're just a bunch of dudes and, and ladies driving around in a, in a nice suburban car for three hours, you know, have a latte, diddle on the radio a little bit, kill some time while you're just cruising down the road at 185 miles an hour. Uh, there's so much more to it than that on a, on a physical level. On a mechanical level, there's just a ton to get into. So we'll get into that with him uh, when when the time comes. And like I said, I'm hoping to line that interview up here in the next week. Uh, we're tentatively slated for early next week to record that, and we'll bring it to bring it to everybody when it happens. But uh, but anyway, Scott, how are you doing? I am. Uh, I'm hanging in there. There's a uh, there's a tear in my beer this evening for uh, <laughs> for my for my Tampa Bay Rays. But uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I thought about you last night when I had that on. I uh, I was hoping for a game seven, if for no other reason than than uh, for your sake. That would have been nice. But hey, you know your Lightning took home a Stanley Cup, so uh, you're you're one for two. Five hundred. That's not bad. That's true. And uh, if the Bucks keep playing the the way that they're playing, who knows? Yeah, well, they brought in some uh, some extra firepower this week that I'm not entirely thrilled about at all. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty disappointed in the team. But uh, that's actually coming up in our dude mail question, so stay tuned for that. So, all right, well, this new thing. Uh, normally we plan headline stories, stuff like that, to kind of dissect and analyze, whether it's in the sports world, whether it's in Hollywood, movies, entertainment, geek culture, that sort of stuff. Um, but tonight, decided to do something a little bit different. We're going to go to borrow a phrase from a friend of mine, a little bit more loosey-goosey edition of this show. I don't own the rights to that. Um, 
And that is that everybody here is just going to take a stab at a topic that's been on their mind lately. It can be, as is the theme of this show, anything. Sports, cooking, barbecue, beer, family stuff. Uh, of course, we get into geek culture stuff and news and TV and all that a lot. But just whatever's on your mind. Call it an open mic segment, if you will. And maybe I'll even have my imaging guy draw us up some Sanders for that if we decide to make this a regular thing. We're just going to go around the room. And uh, everybody just kind of spiel on something or riff on something that, that has kind of been in their sphere lately in their world. And uh, no politics, as always. At least we try and stay out of that as best we can, when we can. Uh, there's enough of that crap going on right now with the election next week. So Lord knows we've all had enough of that. But uh, anyway, all righty. So guys, let me see here. What's a what's a fair and balanced way <laughs> that I can uh, that I can uh, pull this off? Leave the politics out of it. That's right. I don't have a coin to <laughs> I, flip. So I'll tell you what. I will acquiesce. Uh, well, why don't we let uh, why don't we let Scott go first? Since I made fun of him on Twitter not too long ago. I missed that. I uh, need to get on and check that out. Well, it was the last time that you and I did the episode, and I just explained to people very nicely that if they didn't like Scott for some reason, that he wasn't going to be on the episode so it was safe to listen, and I don't know, he took it personally for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> at Kane Fam, uh, Kane's Fam Tally and at Fungo Bots, uh, Fungo Bats people, go nuts. Good Lord, yeah, exactly. I swear I can normally talk like an actual radio personality. <laughs> I am not on my A game tonight, I guess it's because I'd really rather be watching the race, but anyhow... <laughs> All right, so Scott, you want to take this first, man? What you, what's been on your brain lately, man? What what's been going on? Uh, what's something you want to talk about? The, the floor is yours. Riff on, man. Do what you got to do. I think uh, I think lately for me, you know, Ian referenced it, you know, coming out of the top, but uh, you know, being a Tampa Bay sports fan, I've had this like sort of unprecedented time where the Tampa Bay Lightning made their Stanley Cup run, which was super in- incredible and fun to watch, uh, and then switch over to the Rays, who win, have the best record in baseball. They make it through the playoffs. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and then World Series, and so that all came crashing down last night. So this is um, a, like a, just a strange time for me because I was living in the Tampa area for twenty some years, um, thirty plus years. And uh, move away, and the Lightning win the Stanley Cup. The Rays go back to the World Series. The Bucks actually have a winning team this year, and so I'm kind of wondering, you know, if uh, Dave's comment about not wanting me on the podcast is like, well, maybe Tampa was just waiting to get rid of me before their uh, sports teams finally started showing up and winning some games. You were in Tallahassee around o two o three, weren't you? Yes, I was. There you go. When the Bucks win the Super Bowl. That's right. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, really, I've been uh, focused the last you know couple weeks on the on the baseball playoffs and uh, and what Major League Baseball is going to look like in 2021 and how they handled things this year and um, you know I I'm interested to see what they what they take from this year and move on into the 2021 season. I know it's super early to start talking about that kind of stuff, but uh, you know, who are the favorites and all that kind of stuff. We could, you know, expound on those types of things, but um, watching the game last night, um, I had a, I had kind of an issue with, uh, with how the Rays handled it. I don't know if you guys watch game six, but uh, it seemed that uh, Blake Snell got uh, taken out a bit early for uh, for some people's liking and for my liking as well, he had only uh, struck out nine batters over the course of uh, five and a third and given up two hits. Uh, I don't think anybody reached second base, so uh, kind of hard to pull that guy out when pitch count wasn't a wasn't an issue. So I would have liked to have seen Cash stick with him a little bit longer, especially you know here's a guy who's won the Cy Young. He is the best pitcher on your starting pitching staff, and he is pitching in a must-win game. All of those things lined up really well for the Rays, and he was pitching very well. The number of, of swings and misses from the Dodgers lineup was the highest that it had been all series, and so I just felt like, you know, maybe this was the time that you should have stuck with him. So that that was how I felt in the moment that the they were putting too much emphasis on all this data and analytics and this guy's probability of doing this and. You know, the numbers sort of got in the way of, you know, making a good baseball decision. But I've taken a step back here today and started really thinking about what the other side of that coin looked like. And it was the 
analytics and playing that type of baseball that got the Rays with a $28 million payroll to the World Series against the Dodgers, who have one guy making $30 million a year. Um, so, you know, I, I can't be too mad at them for sticking with what got them there, which was following that data and analytics and the numbers told them, you know, it's time to get Snell out of the game. He's going through the lineup at other time. You know, this is, this is that they had the lead at that point and they turned it over to their bullpen, which they've done all year and had been very reliable. So, uh, so I guess I'm, I'm sitting here today, uh, torn as a, uh, as a fan of a team that, uh, really wanted to win the world series and, a baseball person that does value that sort of data and analytics. Um, and I don't think that that's going away in the game of baseball as, as it starts to, as it moves on from this pandemic uh, season where things were just a little bit different. So uh, I would have really liked to have seen how loud Tropicana Field would have gotten this year during the World Series. Um, I can't even imagine what Dodger Stadium would have look like and how they would have reacted watching their hometown team win the World Series after waiting for 32 years. Uh, it would have been incredible to, to give their fans that experience. Uh, but we're in a, we're in a different uh, situation this year and I'm glad that they were actually even able to pull the season off. So, um, so what I think and I hope baseball does going on from here is take what they learned from this season uh, you know, the universal designated hitter, uh, expanding the playoffs, those types of things uh, into future years. And hopefully uh, in February of next year, when all these teams head to their spring training sites, we can actually have some people in the stands and, uh, and get back to watching uh, baseball the way that we have come accustomed to watching it, sitting in the stands, hot dog, cold beer, cheering on your team. So um so that's that's kind of kind of what's been on my mind the last uh, last couple of weeks as uh, as the baseball season wrapped up. You know, listen to you break down the Rays and kind of their approach to baseball and finances and economics. It's fitting that uh, my wife and I watched Moneyball over the weekend. She had never seen it before. So uh, for those who don't know what Moneyball is, do yourself a favor, go back and watch it. It's uh, the story of Billy Bean and the Oakland A's back in the early 2000s and how they really revolutionized how the game is played and managed from a statistical analysis standpoint. You know, this is a lot of you know, what is commonplace now with advanced measurements and sabermetrics and stuff like that. All of that started in Oakland about 20 years ago with mm -hmm. what those guys did. So uh, Brad Pitt puts on a great performance, as he typically does. And it's just, a you know, if you are ever fancied yourself as a sports fan, even if you're not a baseball fan, but you ever had any kind of inkling as to how sport business works – um, that is a phenomenal flick and a phenomenal story mm -hmm. to go back and, and follow because it really did revolutionize the game of baseball. But, um, but no, I, I wholly agree with you, man, on it is going to be wildly interesting over the next year to go and see how sports as a whole you know, assess what it was they were able to do with regard to tweaks and changes to their product on and off the field this year and how much of that stands going forward. You know, I've, I've talked to Nazim on this show about NASCAR and the whole notion of midweek races and double headers and additional road courses and, you know, changes that they can do to shorten their schedule and all of that stuff. And, you know, they've re just released their schedule 2021. We did a I did a hot take edition for the show. And there's a, a good bit of that as reflected. They're even going to put dirt on Bristol Motor Speedway and give that a shot. So this whole notion of opening up the, you know, the, the box of toys and trying to see how new things fit with fans, I think sports will feel a little bit more brazen to, you know, they will feel a bit more um, free to do that moving forward. Um, I don't know that I really want a universal designated hitter. That's just kind of me as an NL guy. I don't, uh, not, I would rather not. I can deal with expanded playoffs, but uh, my problem with that is, you know, baseball was still kind of unique in that regard, man. I mean, to make the postseason of Major League Baseball, it's not like the NFL. I mean, it is really a crowning achievement for your club and for your year to make the playoffs because there were only a handful of teams that got to do that. So now when you, you know, not double that out, but add another, what, four teams? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'll, I'm fine with that, but please no more. Don't, don't get to this crap like they're talking about in college football with 16 teams. It's ridiculous. Don't need that. Don't need that well, at all. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think on the, on the baseball side of things, I – 
I enjoyed the expanded playoffs because playoff baseball to me is the best that baseball gets. Sure, and it um, makes them a crap ton of money in television. Of course. Um, however, you know, the Rays with the best record in, in baseball throughout the season, they won two-thirds of their games, uh, you know, pretty good, uh, pretty good year, and they didn't get anything for it in the postseason. So they, they yes, they got to play the, the number eight seed uh, Blue Jays in the first round, but it was a best of three series. You know, anything can really happen in a best of three game series. So you don't really get that advantage for winning all the games during the regular season and being the best team when you walk in and now you're sort of on even footing. You know, one game can go any way. That's part of the reason why they play so many in the, in the regular season is the, to suss out who's going to be the best. Um, and so over a short series, teams that are at a deficit can make that up because depth isn't as important, especially when it you know relates to pitching staffs and those things. So um, I would like to see them, if they're going to expand the playoffs, they've got to find a way to give those teams that earned the top spots some sort of a, a, an incentive to do so over the course of the regular season. So whether that's giving them a buy through a, through a first round or something to that effect, they've got to find a way to do it besides making that a three-game series. Um, and then to go back to the on the analytic side of things, it was interesting to see uh, the Rays' low budget approach to how they structure a team versus the Dodgers, who are if you if you had to rank the top two teams using analytics in baseball today, it's right. very easy to argue that the Dodgers and the Rays are the top two teams. So now you've got one that has the ability to spend as much money as they possibly can right. to build a roster around these analytics. And then the other one who's almost actively trying to spend the least amount of money to do the same thing. And here they end up in the, in the world series together and play a very spirited series. Um, I mean, it went six games. It never felt like one team really had the huge advantage over the other. Um, I will say that the Kershaw and Walker Bueller um, were lights out every time they stepped on the, on the mound. So, um, they, they were definitely, um, definitely deserved to win based on uh, some of their pitching performances that they got. Dave, what's your take on all of this, man? Whether it's uh, the Tampa Bay sports scene or, I mean, Scott, I think, really touched on something there when he talks about what is sports going to look like from a, you know, a rules standpoint within a year? You know, what are these leagues going to take from, from what has essentially been a great experiment across the board for the NBA, for the NHL, for the NFL, for college ball, for NASCAR? Um, I mean, the, we've seen all kinds of stuff thrown at the wall. What do you think sticks, or as a fan, what would you like to see stick in any of those sports heading into 2021? I think like everybody else, I, I think that there needed to be a plan in place. Uh, and it's not that anybody thought to themselves, oh, my God, what's the worst-case scenario? We need to get into that. But what happens if we can't allow fans in the stadiums for some reason? Whatever it be, whether it be a pandemic or some other issue that's going on. So, you know – I would like to see a little bit better pre-planning, and especially when you look at and you see some of the stuff that's going on, you know, with with Major League Baseball. And you know, baseball for me was weird this year because I, I kept up at a distance for the most part with the Marlins. I've been watching; they've been rebuilding, they've been doing some things. And as you as you see the rebuild that we're doing, and we're trying to go through, and it seems like we're trying to do it the right way. You know, we had a little faith in Der in, in Derek Jeter and the, the people they've got going on. It looks like things are starting to work out; things are starting to move in the right direction. But as I kept up and I looked at the stats and kind of looked a little bit, you know, we had a good run at the beginning of the season, and then we'd win one or two, and then we'd lose one or two, and win one or two. I had no idea they'd made the playoffs. And then all of a sudden, right towards the end of the season, they're like, hey, so Marlins made the playoffs. I'm like, whoa. So, you know, it's – I think he's right when he says, you know, they have all these games to, to, to suss out, you know, who's, who's going to be the better, the better team overall because, I mean, quite frankly, if you look at what we did, we did some things well, but we definitely – didn't deserve to be in the playoffs. Uh, I mean, maybe with how these, some of the other teams were playing, they couldn't catch on quick enough. Um, you know, you definitely don't want with baseball to, to end up with, with um, niche play, which is, you know, you've got, you've, you've got in college football where you've got that, uh, that one offense, used to be Georgia Tech. They never really won games, but they ran that triple option wishbone that everyone hated playing against because it's the one thing out of everywhere we're like, all right, guys, we're playing Georgia Tech this week. We know we're going to walk out with like four defensive linemen injured and uh, we're going to get run over three or four times by these guys and, and they're just they're going to cheat the entire time and it's it's going to suck. But we got to play and we got to go through. It's just crap. And that kind of feels like with baseball, if you're doing it kind of it 
going through, you can you can find that niche, that one quick kind of hit that teams aren't used to playing against or going through. It, it feels like that kind of a thing when you have such a short schedule, which I, I think is where it's at. I'm really hoping that they find a way with with everything to try and keep it interesting. You know, I, I've tried watching some of the the NFL games a little bit just to kind of – it just still feels weird to see nobody in the stands. Uh, you know, you – there's so much energy that the crowd that the the team feeds off of when they when they've got people cheering and there's something going on and you know you have that home field advantage. There's definitely a, a something missing from that when you like like Scott said it would be interesting to see what happens in Tropicana with that going on. You need that. You need those fans to be in there. It's part of the experience. It just you know you got to find a way. You got to find a way around. Is kind of where I'm at with it. Well, what's going to happen there that that is going to be interesting to watch? for me anyway, is what happens to the actual industries that surround sports if you start rolling into the fall of 2021 with no fans? You know? I mean, good Lord, you can look across the board now and see college foot, you know, college athletic programs going by the wayside because they're losing so much money. I mean, they are losing it hand over fist, and that's just the people who are directly tied to this. Um, you know, for, for myriad different reasons, ratings were down this year. And I mean big time down. You know, you look at the NBA Finals, those were the lowest ranked finals in recorded history in terms of ratings. Monday Night Football was down opening night on ESPN, upwards of 50%, 60%, particularly for the uh, for the West Coast game that was the, the second of the doubleheader. So, I mean, they came back around to some degree through the, you know, as the seasons evolved. But, you know, when we talked about this early in the summer and late spring, I think it was – we were the consensus was oh my god when sports comes back people are going to be so ready for it it's going to be unbelievable well it didn't really pan out that way and you coupled that with the inability to make revenue off of butts in the seats if you go rolling into another year of that man it's going to be interesting to see what happens and who stands and who falls and who folds um you know scott and i have talked about this on air off air i don't know if this has been broached on the show or not but there's a lot of eyes on what minor league baseball is going to look like heading into next year because the the way that they manage and, and structure and run minor league baseball is completely changing as of this year. And Scott, you can kind of elaborate a little bit more on that as you want. But basically, the, the you know the bottom third, twenty five to thirty percent of minor league baseball is about to get cut. Like they're they're about to just go bye bye. So, you know, you look at all the restaurants that are in those little moms and pops towns that live and breathe off of minor league ball. They don't have anything to sell anymore. People aren't coming back to the stadiums. They're not buying hamburgers. They're not buying beers. You know, they're not buying swag at the local shop. None of that's happening. So, you know, that ripple effect that you get when there aren't fans in the stands, that's what I'm interested to see. And that's honestly what I'm most fearful about. Yeah, I would say, I would say too, that the, uh, the time shift of when playoffs were played, I think factored in as well. Um, you know, the the NHL and the NBA seasons paused for, uh, I'm not even sure if it was two months, but, you know, or how long it was, but it was, you know, a period of time where um, th- they were playing playoff games at times that they've never played playoff games before in the history of, of the sport. And even now, looking at what hockey and basketball are going to do for the start of their next season, they're pushing that back, uh, and in some cases, into 2021, when they normally would have had some games being played um, in November or December type situation. Um, so the, the time shift of when these things were taking place, and then the overlap of having NBA finals going on at the same time as NHL finals at the same time that college football was getting uh, kicked off and that the NFL was, you know, starting to gear up and you start to see that, you know, there was some cannibalization because you can really only watch one at a time, you know, unless you've got that, that crazy TV set up where you're, you know, you got three games going on, but, uh, but still, I think the NFL for the longest time sort of hung their hat on the fact that they were the, uh, they're the only show in town and you didn't go up against the NFL with another sport. Right. You're talking Even about play- the, cra- the crazy television setup. I'm sorry. I had flashbacks to your apartment in college. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey. All you needed was the kegerator <laughs> in the back. That's true. Um, I, I'm not saying it's a it's a bad idea. Uh, it's just not sustainable, um, you know, to do that over time. You know, what you do in college, you kind of have to leave in college, you know. <laughs> um, but, 
Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, the NFL is going to have to really take a hard look at, um, you know, there might be some leagues that say, you know what, Sunday afternoons, let's go up against the NFL. Let's, you know, let's shift our our seasons and, you know, try to get a share of of that time slot that might be beneficial for us. Who knows what that looks like as we as we go forward. But uh, but definitely the way that uh, the teams are engaging with their fan bases is has certainly changed. and, and you're seeing that in a lot of different uh, streaming options and social media uh, content that's put out there, uh, exclusive content that only lives in, in certain places. Um, it's it's all changed, um, hopefully for the better. But um, I think for for me, I'm uh, I'm excited to see what sort of innovations come out of all of these uh, all of these mandatory or necessary changes that we've had to make this year. All right, Dave, let's kick it over to you, man. What's been on your brain lately? You got the mic. What you got to say? You know, beyond just lately, uh, you know, and, and, and as, as we, we talk about, and of course you guys have known me for a very long time, uh, I have been a Miami fan since as far back as I can remember. I can remember going back and a Miami fan. I'm from the, the, the what we like to call the state of Miami, if you're a Miami Hurricanes fan. I'm from that three-county area down there originally. Uh, I obviously live in Florida State country now. But, you know, I've been around for all five of our national championships as Hurricanes. Uh, One Super Bowl for the Dolphins. Uh, You know, I'm not a big basketball fan. The Heat have won a few championships. The Marlins have won a few baseball championships. Been around for all of that. But the biggest thing when you look down at it is the Miami Hurricanes. Every year, every year, you hear the same thing when they start playing well. Oh, man, Miami's back. Miami's back. Man, oh, yeah. And then they run into something, Clemson or something, and just get run over. Guys, if you have to ask the question, Miami's not back. Miami will be back when they cut back to winning championships, when they get back to doing the things that Miami has done over the course of their of their history. You don't need to keep asking. You, you, you go through Watch the games. Enjoy the process. Be a part of what's going on. Right now, we have a, a good team, a better team than, quite honestly, I expected them to be. They're struggling. They're going back and forth. They're fighting. They're getting better under this coach. We're not back. Stop getting out there as Miami fans and, and walking around like we own the earth, like we have things going on that, that, that we don't. I mean, if you watch the Clemson game from a few weeks ago and you see what happened there, that's what happens when you're at the pinnacle of college football. You get out there, you absolutely destroy teams like we used to do, and you destroy good teams that make mistakes like Miami does. So when you go forward from this and you, you look at what's going on, and, and, and you know Miami sports are different because if you look at what's going on in large cities like that, typically no matter what sports you have in the city of Miami, there's not a whole lot uh, – there's a whole lot more to do than just that. So no one wants to go watch a bad team play. Right. Uh, the Dolphins are getting better. The Hurricanes are getting better. The Marlins made the playoffs. The Heat were in the were in the uh, the finals this year. All on teams that really weren't supposed to do that well uh, this year. But they're they're getting better. They're building. We know how good we can be. Let's just support the team we have in front of us. Continue to help them get better and not be that guy that gets on social media that immediately. After a 277-yard and four-touchdown performance out of Derek King, go, man, they need to bench that guy. That guy just go sit down. He, he, he sucks. He's terrible. That's, that's terrible. Four touchdowns and 277 yards? Oh, that's, that's, that's terrible. Stop being a piece of crap. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Miami as a, as a market for market has a lot of the same problems that, uh, that L.A. does. Um, you know, I mean, good, good grief. I mean, how many times are we going to have the NFL in Los Angeles and sit there and watch, uh, you know, a 50% full stadium? I mean, there's just too much other stuff out there to compete for the entertainment dollar. So, um, right. let me ask you this about your, your beloved hurricanes. How much does do things like facilities play into Miami's inability to get back? Cause I will tell you something, and this is not a dig, it's a statement of fact. And Scott's been up here long enough. Uh, in the Raleigh-Durham area that, that he could probably back me up on this. Up here in the Research Triangle, you are in the heart of Atlantic Coast Cons- Conference country. I mean, this is this is the mecca for ACC sports in Raleigh-Durham. 
Duke, UNC, NC State. All right, it is, this is it. This is the cradle of it. So there was a lot of hype when Miami came into the ACC. It was Miami, BC, and Syracuse came over from the Big East, and they got the U. And this was going to be the final piece in the puzzle to make the ACC a legitimate football power. They mock up here the fact that they ever felt that way about Miami because Miami has just not delivered. So bringing that to the point, a lot of people would attribute that to the arms race in coaches' salaries and particularly in facilities. Nowadays, you look at programs like Clemson and Alabama that have a freaking palace for a football-only facility on their campus. And when you're bringing in a 17-year-old kid who's never had anything, it's kind of hard to sell him on a 30-year-old dorm versus, you know, the, 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 the Grand Palace in Tuscaloosa. Um, Miami is a private school. You certainly had a president there for a good long time in Shalala who didn't give a rat's ass about football, and she basically did everything in her power to neuter your program and your athletic department. How, how much of that has, has attributed to Miami's lack of ability to get back on track? You know, I think that some of it has, you know, there, it's different. And when you look at what goes on in, in North Carolina and you look at what happens in Alabama and you look at what happens in some of these other places, it's not the same. Uh, and, and I know that a lot of schools say that, but if you look back at the history of college football and modern college football, um, and I don't even, I'm, this isn't even a brag for us. We invented modern college football when it comes to defense. I mean, you look at what was going on in the early to mid eighties in college football, and you had linebackers that were six foot two, six foot three, 270 pounds, slow, but they could hit, man. You ran up the middle and these guys were going to run you over. And all of a sudden you had these guys that were six foot one, six foot two, 220 pounds. And they could run their 40 yard dash with some of the wide receivers that were out there. And these guys were hitting corner to corner. And oh, by the way, they could run you over. And everyone had to adapt. You look at what's gone on with Miami over the last 40 years, what has happened, how things have gone forward. Obviously offenses have done something a little different. We've actually adapted to what's going on because we're running that that you know, run pass option, you know, no huddle, fast pace offense that a lot of offenses are running right now because you got to keep up, keep the keep the the athletes happy and kind of keep them going through. Uh, we're trying to adapt on that part of it, but when it comes down to tradition, putting people, we still we still put people in the NFL every year. Are we going to get those five star guys sometimes that that are slipping away to some of the other schools because of the large facilities? Sure. But if you look back at history and you look back at how college football has gone, very few actual five-star recruits go on and do very well in the NFL. And whether that be that they just couldn't make it in the NFL, didn't make it in college once they got out, you could go a couple different ways with that. But you look back at Sean Taylor. Sean Taylor was a three-star recruit coming out of high school. You build those guys that want to go to a program, that want to play, that you can teach. What happened to us is... 2001, we win a national championship. We have what is arguably the best team to ever sit on a college football field. You've got so many guys that went in the first round, so many guys that went in the NFL. They went the next year and went undefeated until they ran into Ohio State. And then Butch Davis is gone, so you don't have that same engine that's running the recruiting portion of it. And you have a guy named Larry Coker that, God bless him, was just, just driving that car to a certain extent, uh, with but he had somebody in the passenger seat that was that was the the student driver. You know, he he was the student driver. You had the the other guy in the car trying to go through, and that was all these players. And as the players got less and less about team and more and more about themselves, and less of these these high, you know, more more talented guys were coming in, we started going downhill. And of course, at that point, we also had, like you mentioned, uh, Shalala that just didn't really care about what was going on with the program. Uh, she didn't like what the program stood for. She didn't like the the tradition that we have, the swag that, that Miami has had over the years. So for her, you know, she'd rather, you know, focus on academics and do what's going on there, even though the football program traditionally has brought in a, a ton of money. So we did fall behind. We're starting to pick back up on some of the facilities. In South Florida, those those kids, for the most part, want to play for that symbol. That's something they've grown up seeing. It's something that they've gone around. And when they were young, they may not have seen the same amount of winning that we've had on. But you have so many generations down there that talk about, no, this is what it is, this is what's going on, and you have a lot of that going through. We're slowly but surely getting that back. As we continue to win more, we're putting more people in the NFL. It's going to take time. It's just not the same what we had. Of course, we hit probation again 
in the mid 2000s that didn't help us with what's what else has gone on with our portion of it but i think with what you have now you have a guy that's all about that program he's all about that city he has connected the city back to the program again with with manny diaz and when you have that when you have a guy who's, whose family's been all about the city been all about that area trying to bring back that portion of it that, that we had from the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s where you want to put that wall around the, the state of Miami, as we like to call it, like Schnellenberger did. I think it just takes time. It, it's not the same the same recruiting era that we had in the 80s and 90s. Once we start getting that back and start winning again and going through, you'll see kids come back. Are they going to update the facilities? I'm sure at some point they'll, they'll do some of that down there. But it, it won't be the same as some of these larger schools. I still think that we'll be able to win and compete at some point in the future. See, it is my hope, dovetailing back to what we were kind of touching upon with, uh, with Scott and kind of the, the financial climate of sport across the board. It is my hope that we have seen the end of the arms race for some time for facilities and coaching salaries and that sort of crap in, in college football. You know, for, for all of the talk about paying players and whether or not players deserve a cut, and, and I think there's a legitimate argument to be made for that. But, but call me naive for this. I would love to see a world whereby, and I'm just going to pull an arbitrary figure here. Let's say that, you know, college football generates roughly $3 billion in revenue, all right, from television to signage, ad time, da 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 Let's just say $3 billion a year. And let's say the operating cost to run up an athletic department could total out at somewhere near $1 billion for all the college football programs, college athletic programs in America. How about we just take that other $2 billion and funnel it back into the universities and make it more affordable for kids to go to college who can't dribble a, fo- a basketball or catch a football? You know, that's, that's what I want to see. Rather than trying to figure out how we can distribute the money among coaches and players and da-da-da-da-da, how about we figure out what we all need in order to be able to produce this product that we call college football and turn the rest back over to the universities to make college affordable for kids again? Like, that's, that's kind of my deal on it. And I have the luxury of being able to say that as a guy who's a fan of a, you know, a major marquee brand in college football. You know, I think it's absolutely absurd that a college football coach can make $8 million a year or 70, you know, seven, seven, five, whatever Jimbo is and Harbaugh makes and those guys. That's stupid. There's no reason a college football coach ought to make that. NFL, completely different story. Completely different story. If you can make it, go get it. That's what it's there to be. It's professional sport. But, um, you know, as I watch the, the cost of tuition climb and climb and climb and climb, it's just like, guys, what, what in the hell are we doing here, you know? So that's kind of my, my take on that. I would tell you, getting back to Miami, my only question about Miami and whether or not they can get back is, number one, I don't think that brand means as much to you, means as much to kids down there nowadays as you think it does. Um, I think you could say that for just about any historic brand that has not had immediate success in the last four or five years. I mean, Florida State brand doesn't mean much of anything to kids right now, and we just won a national championship in 2013. All right, so it's not that long ago that we were relevant. You can't sell the Florida State brand to a five-star recruit right now. Why in the world would they want to go down there instead of Clemson or Alabama or one of these places that actually has a track record of showing that they're going to develop you? Right? The There's brand itself doesn't mean anything right now to a whole lot of kids. There's a huge difference, though, and this is this is the point that I'm trying to make. There aren't a whole lot of five-star kids coming out of Lincoln. There's not a whole lot of five-star kids coming out of Godby, Leon, Rickards. Those are all Tallahassee high schools, for those of you that aren't in the area. There aren't a whole lot of five-star kids coming out of there. Look at Broward, Dade, Palm Beach County. There's your five-stars. There's your four-stars. There's your high-end three-stars. You got kids that would start anywhere else in the country that go to sit at major universities because they want to learn and they want to go through because they are five stars and three stars that people from Texas and California and Oregon and upstate New York come down to come see. That's why it's different in Miami. They grew up in that shadow. Unfortunately, we don't have the, where we can say the shadow of the Orange Bowl anymore because of what happened with Shalala again. We don't have our own stadium. We don't have that facility. We do have a world-class facility that we rent. I mean, if you want to look at it that way, it is a very nice stadium. It's very well put together. They've done a lot to it to make it a better place. I was there for the Notre Dame game a couple years ago, and that was the loudest place I had ever been in in my life. And I have been in some loud stadiums with some big games going on. I've been in two national championship games. And it's just in the Superdome, by the way, with one of them. 
It's different than Tallahassee. It's different than Ohio State. It's different than Alabama. Tuscaloosa comes to Miami. Florida State comes to Miami. Gainesville comes to Miami. Miami has all that going on down there for them. They want a kid that's great. They want a kid that's going to change their program. They don't have to travel. They go down the road. They find that school. They find that kid. That's a kid they see every day. That's a kid that they've seen since he was eight years old playing peewee ball that some of these kids, these coaches have seen going through. It's different anywhere else. Everyone comes to where we are and they fish in our pool. That's why Schnellenberger said we put a wall around the state of Miami. Because you want to win football games, that's where you get your kids from. You dabble outside of that a little bit, but for the most part, you want to pull your kids from where we play every day. I take your point on that, man, but the only thing I would say to that is they didn't give a crap about Miami when Jimbo Fisher was at Florida State. The minute he walked into a room, you can ask anybody who recruited for for any university in the Southeast, but especially Miami. Jimbo Fisher walked into the room, he pretty well knew nine out of ten times he was going to walk out with a signing. Uh, nowadays, it's that way with Saban. It's that way with Sabo, uh, with Sabo, with Dabo. Um, you know, you could you could make the argument that Orgeron can walk into Miami. Heck, there were Miami kids playing on the field at Louisville last week as they stuck the screws to us. So uh, I'm just saying, man. I think I think Miami is definitely still a, a fertile, fertile recruiting ground for worlds of talent. I just don't think they have the incentive to stay in Miami that they did in '03, '04 when the freshness of Miami still being the U was available. 18, 17 year old kids. Now they don't remember a time when Miami was any good. That's just a legend that they've heard about. But I do think you're onto something when you say it's going to fall onto the older generations to remind them of that. I mean, Mac Brown came into Carolina and is essentially locked back down the state of North Carolina for recruiting because guys in their forties remember him, you know, kid, listen, if you're going to go to, to Clemson or Alabama, you're, you're going to go there. You're not going to stay in North Carolina. But if you're a four-star kid and you can you know, go to Alabama and compete and maybe start by your junior year, or you can stay home and play right now in Chapel Hill, you've got 40 guys in their 40s and 50s saying, son, that's Mac Brown back in Chapel Hill. You need to stay home in North Carolina. And so they are. That's the road I think Miami's got to go. But, you know, touching upon what you just said a second ago, how do you expect college kids to want to drive an hour to a stadium that's not even theirs? You know, you had better win. Yeah. That's the only way you fill up that stadium because otherwise you've got 20,000 butts at the seats. Well, and but if you look at it, though, when we do win, and if you, I mean, perfect example is going to be, again, that Notre Dame game. That entire stadium was packed out. Typically when they play bigger teams, absolutely, you're never going to, to pack out that stadium with students. There's not enough students there. You could take every student that goes to the University of Miami fill that stadium over three times with just the number of students that are there at that small private university. The city, the city is where you've got to get that support from. And when they win, they get it. But that's, again, the, the point that I'm making at the beginning of this when it comes to how Miami sports is overall. It's a very ADD town. No one goes to, to watch uh, the Heat play until they're doing well. No one goes to watch the Dolphins play until they're doing well. There's too much other things down there to do. And that was that's where we're at on the, on the beginning of this is... It's it's that's that's how it works in these big markets. Uh, you know, when it comes to, to how we do things uh, down there, I think that's the same when we're talking with Mac Brown. You got these forty year old guys that remember Mac Brown. Well, you've got these forty year old guys whose sons are now playing in Miami, playing in this uh, for high school in the, in the city of Miami. That talk about that, and the first thing they do, and one of the smartest things I think Manny Diaz did, was he turned around and, and got uh, Ed Reed back in there. You got a guy that just recently retired from the NFL that talks about how great everything is teaches these kids, becomes a father figure for these kids, give it time. I mean, we're, we're going to get back to that. I just I just want I want the Miami faithful. The Miami faithful get it. The people that have been fans for a while understand it takes time to do this kind of stuff. But these other guys, that, that these internet trolls that get on there and want to talk about, you know, oh, four touchdowns and 277 yards, man. That guy threw one interception. He sucks. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that note, as we tick past the 43-minute mark here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the mic with mine. And actually, I dub, uh, <laughs> Dave just gave me like the perfect segue right into exactly which was my uh, kind of my, my soapbox. Guys, the smartest thing I've probably done in seven, eight months was turn off the notifications to my social media on my phone. I kid you not. Life has not been happier for me. You know, Dave just nailed it. You know, the trolls that are on Twitter, particularly on Twitter, 
there's just no need for it after a while. You know, and I think I just hit a point somewhere around eh, four or five weeks ago when I just kind of decided, you know what, I'm over it. I love staying in touch with sports. I love staying in touch with NASCAR. Uh, you know, I have a number of, of, whether it's drivers or team officials or sport officials, reporters down in Tallahassee, people that I, you know, I enjoy their stuff that I'd get push notifications from. But, you know, you couple all of that with all the push notifications I get from my sports apps or my news apps or what have you. And after a while, couple all that with the the election stuff and the fact that everybody's trying to cram information down your throat. You factor in all the trolls. I hit a point when I just needed some silence. And I watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, which I would highly recommend anybody give a shot to. That's a pretty eye-opening deal. Um, but yeah, I just I hit a point one day when I decided, you know what, I'm done with this. And I, I still log in on social media. I can't not, because that's where I connect with my readers. Um, I can't not be a part of that. I still enjoy talking about sports and movies and all that stuff on Twitter like I always have. Sharing Spotify links, that's all great. And I, you know, I... I earmark certain stretches of the day when I'm going to be on there on, you know, on the web and talking about it. Um, and occasionally if I think about it, when I pick up my phone, if I want to slide over to, to Twitter and see what's going on on my NASCAR list, let's say, then I'll do that. But I'm over the days of being just inundated with push notifications with a bunch of information that I just frankly don't have to have. I'm going to go get it when I want to access it. And then I'm going to put it away and I'm going to move back to real life. Because the online world has just hit a, a fever pitch that's a bit too much for me. I need built-in time when I can say, you know what? I'm completely unplugged and that's that. So for people who follow me, particularly in the, uh, in the Facebook group and on Twitter, if you don't get an immediate response from me or a timely response, it's probably because I've checked out of social media for the day and I'm not getting push notifications through my phone anymore to be able to know that you're trying to talk to me. But I will get it the next morning when I get up and I check in over coffee. So, uh, so that's kind of my deal, man. If you want some peace and quiet in this world, that's kind of hard to come by. But one thing you can do, shut off your stinking notifications to social media, man. Go there when you want to be there and then run away and, and stay gone. So uh, life is much happier in my world since I did that, man. <laughs> I'm a fan. I don't know that I'll ever turn them back on. I still get Messenger. So for folks who need to get a hold of me directly that way, I, I still got that. But other than that, man, it's been great to be off. Great to get some space. Uh, of course, uh, being able to look out the back door and see water, I'm sure, helps with that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being able to chill out in a rocking chair with a bourbon or a cup of coffee and look at a lake, that's nice. That's very nice. <laughs> so, anybody want to touch I, that? Anybody got thoughts? I, I would say that uh, I, I agree with you completely. I, I too watched the uh, the social dilemma, and um, and even before that, I got into a point where I was trying to find other ways to distract myself when I had free time. So, you know, I, I started. I actually did a, a an audit of how much time I was spending on social media, and just scrolling and endlessly. Um, and then I use that at the same time to go through and scrub my social media list. So I, I realized that I was just like randomly just scrolling through things. Things were passing by, you know, the same people would, would post, you know, a, a news article about this thing. And then I just realized like, I'm not interested in reading that anymore. So why is it cluttering up my feed? Uh, it's actually just taking more time for me to scroll through it and scroll past it. Uh, so if I get rid of it, maybe I can get through my scroll faster and spend less time, you know, staring at the screen and doing doing those things. I think um, it's uh, been particularly bad over this last couple of months, only because people ha are running out of things to distract themselves with. Um, so many people can't spend time with themselves or actually think about what they would want to be doing and actually go and do it. Uh, it's just much easier to pick up the phone and scroll through endlessly. So. Um, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I think it's, it, it has its, it's, it has its merits. Um, I get a lot of information from it, from the people that I trust. And, um, other than that, I'm trying to not spend any time on it. Yep. I will say that's always been one thing I have liked about Twitter for all the toxicity that is on that program. Their listing feature is a godsend because when I want to know about Florida state sports, I go to my sports line list and it's, all the guys from Tallahassee, it's War Chan, it's Tom Hawk Nation, and mm -hmm. it's just people that I've vetted and said, I want to hear what you have to say. And as long as I don't wade off into the, into the comments or the replies, which is just never a good idea, that's asking for trouble, um, you know what, that's just the information I'm looking for. 
And as long as I stay on that narrow path, whether it's for NASCAR, whether it's for publishing stuff, whether it's for, you know, geek culture stuff, as long as I just do that, I can, I can be okay and I can get off. Dave, how about you, man? What's your so, thought on this? So, so, so basically what you're saying is, is, um, I should no longer feel connected by staying away from everyone by scrolling through an app to make myself feel like I'm connected. <laughs> Something to that effect. Yeah. Here's a novel idea. And I know this is going <laughs> to blow a lot of people's minds, but they got this thing called a telephone. And when you pick it up and you dial a funky number, there's somebody on the other end that will talk to you in real time with an actual conversation. Do more of that. And listen, I tried I got, that. I tried that as a kid, and I got in a lot of trouble with the credit card bill. Sorry. <laughs> uh, how did I know? I didn't crap on your soapbox, man. Why you got to hit me with the sarcasm and the 900 number references? Bad memories, man. Bad memories. <laughs> abort, abort. So, but no, but that, that, you know, bringing my little diatribe to a close, that's it. I think everybody, particularly now more than ever, could stand to get off of social media. I'm not saying just abandon it altogether because, listen, it does serve a purpose. It, you know, it is nice to be able to see what's going on with my sister and the kids down in Tallahassee and stay in touch with friends and family. And, I, listen, it does serve a purpose. But put a clock on it, man, and shutting off your notifications is a great way to go about doing that. The real world is not online. The real world is out here. And I know a lot of us are stuck in houses and we're all stuck in quarantine because everybody's freaked out about this virus in some instances, rightfully so. But uh, but don't just get so loaded into a freaking screen, man, that you lose all touch with reality because that just doesn't do well for anybody. And it's why, frankly, we got a lot of problems that we got. So with that, let's go see what the people's got to say, shall we? How about a little dude mail? Hit it. You got mail. Okay, bring up our questions here. Da, 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 da. Question number one comes to us from. Da, 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 da. Let's see here, Matt. Yeah, Matt, we'll read yours. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this one because we already touched on it earlier. All righty, hey dudes, how's it going? Now that the dust has settled on the MLB, NBA, and NHL seasons, show of hands. Who among us actually views the Dodgers, Lakers, or Lightning championship runs without a big fat asterisk? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Yeah, I didn't think so. Stay awesome, and thanks for fielding my dude mail. Uh, how much? We talked about this the preseason, man. Uh, it's 60-game regular season of Major League Baseball. It's an asterisk. But we just crowned a champion. All right, same thing in the NHL. We did the bubble thing up in Canada. We crowned a champion. Same thing in the NBA. Crowned a champion. Now that the dust is settled, we've actually seen this play out. How big of an asterisk do you put by those championships? Scott, I'll start with you because your team actually won one of these. Uh, no asterisk for the Lightning. <laughs> um, and I, I wouldn't say that there'd be one for the NBA either, um, only because their regular season was about 95% complete before they went into the bubble. Right. Um, and then they also gave those teams a chance to play in to a playoff spot. At least they did on the hockey side of things. So. To me, that's a legitimate full season, full playoff. It doesn't take away anything from the grind that, that the, the hockey playoffs are. Um, quite honestly, I didn't pay any attention to the NBA, um, but they too were at the almost at the end of their season. It sounds like they did a full um, full postseason as well. So I can't really you know knock them for getting almost their full season in and a full postseason. Baseball, on the other hand. Uh, might be the wrong day to ask me if there should be an asterisk next to the Dodgers <laughs> championship, but um, you know, let's just let's just say that um, on the baseball side of stuff, let's let's be careful about how we give out the awards at the end of the season. Um, you know, Cy Young Award, MVPs, those types of things. Um, to me, those might need an asterisk because the statistics that go along with those awards are going to be you know pared down by a third or by two thirds. Um, but you know, a championship when everyone agrees to the rules about how a championship is played, you know, they earned it. So let's give it to them. I don't think anybody's going to forget that the 2020 was the year of the pandemic. I gotcha. Dave, how about you, man? What we'll say you on this? Absolutely. There should be a, a, a asterisk in front of all of them. And the, the biggest reason why is this. It doesn't matter how far along you were in your season, when everything happened, if you spent the entire time in the bubble, some of the time in the bubble, 
no time in the bubble, whatever happened, when you go into a playoff atmosphere and you don't have the same environment, you don't have that same atmosphere around you of the fans and how things go crazy and it's going through, it skews how things happen. There's a reason why people don't win very often in Tuscaloosa. There's a reason why people don't win very often in Ohio State. Not only are they a good team, but there's so much of an advantage when it comes to noise. Yep. Uh, I just think that it's the same thing. Yeah, no, I, I see the merits of both. I'm inclined to lean a little bit more Dave's way, particularly in the area of college football, because so much has changed. Um, and frankly, there have been so many games that weren't played because of exposures and cases and case spikes and all that kind of stuff. So I'm inclined to say, yeah, a l- little bit of a, um, you know, l- little bit of an asterisk. Uh, Scott makes a valid point about the NBA and that they had the vast majority of their season concluded before all this happened. So definitely something to be said for that. I wouldn't know. I don't watch the NBA anymore. Um, sorry, checked out on that league. It's just not for me. All right, next question comes to us from Dante. Hey, fellas, saw on your Twitter feed that Dexter is coming back for a ninth season. Am I the only one who's excited about this? Because Lord knows that season eight series finale they pushed on us was a complete total uh, pile of crap. Sorry, Dante, I'm butchering your question here, dude. Uh, I would welcome the chance for the showrunners to come back and close this story out with the integrity and the dignity that it deserves. Anyway, fingers crossed that whatever this new thing is, it doesn't suck. Dave, you're a big Dexter guy, man. What say you about a limited Dexter run on Showtime? I'm excited to see as long as they can put some of it together, but he makes a point. Are they going to be able to go back and fix that piece of crap that they stuck us with at the end of it? Because if they can fix that, then absolutely. If not... Let guys, it's like it's like the end of Game of Thrones. Let's let's just let it die at this point. Yep. Scott, how about you, man? Were you a Dexter guy? Uh, was Dexter part of an NBA team? Because I didn't see a single <laughs> single minute of it. All right, we'll shoot you a trailer when the uh, when the show's over with. It was interesting. It's uh, you should it's take a, the time though. Seriously, it is a good show. It really is well a, written. It's written. a very interesting show. It'll uh, it'll make your just, stomach churn a little bit. Just don't watch the finale. Yeah. Well, apparently, till they try and rewrite it, because that's. I what mean, they're gonna do. you can. You're not going to be happy with it, but you can. I don't know that you'll right. be as livid about it as we were with the Sopranos, or at least that I was with the Sopranos. But All right, next question comes from Nolan. With the AFC East being the complete and total dumpster fire that it is this year, did the Dolphins do the right thing, pulling the trigger on to a time? Me personally, I think the kid could have benefited from another year behind, or from a full year behind the clipboard, but that's just me. I digress. Uh, Dave, actually, I'll totally throw this one to you because you're the resident Dolphins fan, man. Tua Tagovailoa is uh, is now your starter. What say you? You know, I, I understand why they made the decision when they did. It gave him a full two weeks of practice time going through. I really think he would have benefited more from uh, from from playing the Jets if you were going to go this direction because that's a bad team that you can kind of go through instead of playing your first game against the Rams who have a really, really good defense. Uh, I do feel bad for, for Ryan Fitzpatrick because, I mean, that dude does nothing but go in, play hard, just becomes a part of a team. I mean, he's like he's like a puppy. He comes in, everybody loves him, everybody pats him on the head, he goes and chases a bone, and then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, he gets taken back to the pound and another team comes and picks him up. <laughs> so I do feel bad because the, the guy has done nothing but come in and, and be a winner for us when it comes to just how his attitude's been and what he's done well with us. Uh, I, I really wish that, that maybe they'd handled that a little differently or maybe given him a little bit different timeline to say, hey, here's what we're looking to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're going to have a throwaway season for a guy that you want to have the opportunity that – I don't want to say wins and losses don't count – but at least it's one of those years where it's like you, there's other things you can kind of blame it on if he isn't quite as good as you're hoping. I think it works out well that way. This is a good year to do that. Scott, Dolphins and two a time. Too soon or was this the right time? Uh, I don't know that there's ever – if it's ever too soon. I think you get some – you know, for, for the Dolphins, for them to plan for the future, they've got to know what they have right now. And if uh, they find out that uh, Tua can't cut it or th- they didn't get what they thought they were going to get, then uh, they're behind the eight ball again. So, um, you know, I'm not I'm not opposed to them making the move now. All righty. Next question comes. <laughs> this is awesome. Next question comes to us from a man called Hawk. He's either a huge Cobra, uh, Cobra Kai fan or he's an old dude who remembers Spencer for hire. All right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see here. What is his deal? Looking at the headlines on Screen Rant, Geek Tyrant, and the like. He's definitely a Cobra Kai fan. Uh, it occurs to me that there's... <laughs> he speaks internet. He's a geek. <laughs> it occurs to me that there's just not much happening in the world of geek culture. I mean, seriously, does anybody actually care that Jared Leto is reprising his role as the Joker for the Snyder Cut? Same for Avatar 2, Matrix 4, Black Widow, etc. It's all just meh. What in the wide, wide world of geekdom happened here? Uh, the pandemic, I think, is pretty much what happened with this. Uh, a lot of those projects, a lot of the big tentpole projects have been tabled. Nobody knows when they're coming out. So it's kind of hard to drum up, you know, interest and publicity for something when you never know when it's actually going to release. Just ask the new Bond flick. Like, they've been trying to release that thing since freaking April. And uh, they've already punted it, what, three times now? Until it finally landed in 2021. So um, I think that's part of why you're not hearing a whole lot, uh, particularly on the big screen. Definitely a lot of stuff going on, or more stuff anyway, going on on the smaller screen with streaming. And we actually have another question on that coming up here in just a second. Um, so we'll, we'll tag on that. But, I mean, I think that's just the vast majority of it. The, the pandemic has brought everything to a screeching halt, whether you're talking about pro and college sports or whether you're talking about, you know, comic book tentpole films. I will take your point, though, on uh, Jared Leto. Nobody gives a crap. Like, that guy's the he's, – he's the bridge from, uh, you know, from Heath Ledger to, you know, uh, to Joaquin Phoenix. Like, he's that guy who just had to be the poor bastard who followed Heath Ledger. Um, you know, Avatar 2, I don't care. Matrix 4, I definitely don't care. And I've seen Black Widow for 10 years. I don't need a movie for her either. But there is stuff coming out there that I do want to see when and if the time comes. So, uh, Scott, I'll give you uh, give you second run on this one, man. What's your, what's your spiel on all of this? Yeah, I think there just seems to be a little bit of uh, just fatigue. I mean, there's been there's so much content pushed out over so much time that everyone was invested in. And all of these large story arcs all were wrapped up. Some people were happy with how it, how it finished up. Um, you know, I would say that the, the justice league folks probably not super thrilled with how things have been going in that direction. So, uh, their fatigue may have turned into apathy, but, um, you know, there's, there has been, was so much for so long. And now, you know, I think there's a, needs to be a little bit of a break for us to really appreciate what they're doing with, uh, with some of these, uh, sci-fi films. Dave, what say you? I have one thing to say, and we can move forward with this. Jared Leto, go back to the hole you crawled out of. (laughs) And film Tron 3. (laughs) All right, next question comes to us from Dalton. So, Antonio Brown to the Bucks. Oof. Scott and Ian, what are your thoughts? That other guy can weigh in, too, if he wants. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) First of all, Dalton and Hawk, what 80s movie are we stuck in right now? Scott, you're a Bucky. What say you, man? Antonio Brown, what what was your reaction when you read that headline that we brought him in? Well, first, Dave, I think my Twitter fans have spoken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your Twitter fan has spoken. Yes, sir. You're right. Exactly. <clears throat> There's one. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, as long as he's, he's taking his meds, let's give him a shot. But, like, you know, they're already talking about how you know, Mike Evans, who's the premier receiver for the for the Bucks right now, his catches are down, but defenses are still focusing on him like he's still the star of the offense. So um, I don't know I don't know where these footballs are going to go. Uh, Brady has already figured out that uh, he and Gronk still have the uh, incredible connection that they had all those years in uh, in New England. They're using that to its fullest advantage. I don't really see a spot for him in the lineup, but you know. I don't know. It's probably more of a bad move, in my opinion. I, I think you have more potential bad things happening with him in the locker room than uh, any any good gains that you would get between the lines. Other guy, you want to weigh in on Antonio Brown to the Bucks? Uh, bad idea. Bad idea halfway through the season. Uh, I mean, I don't think Antonio Brown has ever proved that he can be a team player anywhere he's been. If you want to mess up your team chemistry by bringing that guy in on the off chance he's going to be what he was six years ago, Mm-hmm. Have at it. Yep, I am completely in sympatico with Brother Daniels on that one. I want no part of this guy, and um, quite to the contrary, I have a hard time rooting for the Bucks because of this. I'll be honest with you, and I've made no bones about this, my interest in the NFL has really waned over the last couple of years anyway. Um, I just don't love the pro game like I used to for a whole lot of different reasons. I just don't. Um 
but you know, you throw this in, I'm not rooting for this guy. I'm just not. He's a complete and total piece of crap. You take all of his antics, you know, in the locker room and all that completely off the table. There's still sexual abuse charges thrown in here, legal issues. The guy is a complete and total waste of a roster spot for me. And I just, I don't, you know, crap like this is why, and not to get off on the, you know, politics and sports thing, but this is frankly why I think a whole lot of fans just roll their eyes whenever they get lectured about what's morally right and wrong from sports. Because, you know, on one side, you're going to tell me that, you know, this is the right thing to do and it's socially just and we've got to do this. And then on, you know, the very next page, I read the headline that a guy like this still has the right after all of the strikes that he's had on and off the field to make millions catching a football. So what are we doing here? You know, and and I hate the fact that this is my team. And we did this back in the Gruden days with um, Jeremy Stevens. Remember him? He was a tight end from Seattle, raped a girl, uh, allegedly. I want to say they convicted him for that. And, um, you know, but John Gruden will sign him. Why? Because he can play football. It is a mercenaries league. It has been for decades. There's no sense sugarcoating it another way. This is what they are. So, okay, I can, I can work with that. I can, I can roll with that, that that's the decision that you've made. Let's play some football. But stop preaching to me about what's morally right and wrong when guys like this still make millions to catch a football. And like I said, I just I hate the fact that it's my team that's pulling the trigger on this because he's a piece of garbage. So anyway, go Jaguars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question comes to wow. us from Drew. Oh, I had a hot take ready to roll in the barrel for that one. I had that one from the minute I saw the tweet from Joe Bucks fan that they had inked the deal. <laughs> so, uh, all right, next question, final question, comes to us from Drew. I uh, recently read online where Disney is pivoting their entertainment model away from a full-throttle movie focus toward one that centers more on the small screen with streaming on Disney+. Plus. Couple this with the article you guys posted on social media the other day about AMC theaters circling the drain, and it looks a lot like the small screen is really the place to be right now. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's definitely... Um, that's definitely the case. Um, you know, in, in the comic book world, you have certainly seen that pivot big time. Um, you know, a lot of Marvel and Star Wars projects are now being planned exclusively for Disney+. Plus. DC is going full bore with HBO Max. It was rolled out that they're not going to have a Green Lantern series. Um, so, I mean, a lot of, lot of stuff happened. The CW obviously has their, their hero verse going on over there with freaking every DC character under the sun not named Batman. Um you know, so it's 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 an interesting time to be a geek. There's a lot of stuff on television. Um, and I think a lot of it too is this is where people can you know this is where people can access it right now. Like we talked about before, there is no going to a theater, so you may want to see the big blockbuster on the big screen with the big Coke and the big tub of popcorn, but that's just not an option right now. So do you want to wait another year or possibly two to see it then, or do you want to see it now on your home screen with your own, you know, your own popcorn and your own bathroom right around the corner? Most folks are going to opt for the, the latter option. Studios are rolling with that shift. The big question is going to be when theaters do finally reopen and people do feel safe going back out to those venues now, um, you know, will they be so far down the rabbit hole? Will they have let the genie out of the bottle where streaming will still be the preferred platform? I don't know. Only time is going to tell on that. But, uh, Dave, what are your thoughts on this, man? A lot of stuff coming out on streaming, not so much on the big screen. Uh, is that a trend that you see sticking for the long haul? I, I really see this as more of a blockbuster having the opportunity to buy Netflix for $2.5 million and going no. If you walk away from this and you, you walk away from the opportunity to continue to do this and move your stuff to that screen, I, I think that the people that don't do this, and you're still going to have your stuff. I mean, Ian, you and I talk all the time about going and seeing things on the big screen because they're worth seeing on the big screen. The big explosions, the big action movies. But your rom-coms, your things that are fun to watch, you have a little a little moment on the side, you take your lady to, those aren't ones that, unless you just want that movie theater experience, obviously right now a whole lot of people don't, but if you just unless you just want to be able to go and sit down with a tub of popcorn, those are things you can do from the house now for cheaper. Make your own popcorn. Go through. I, I think it's smart, and I think it's going to end up being where we go from here on for most of what we consume. And then instead of having these huge multiplexes like you have around the country, you're going to have it pared down. It'll go through, and you'll you'll have just your one or two theaters that are showing your big screens, maybe three or four theaters, depending on how large the area is. They're just showing your big action movies that need to be seen on those side screens. Scott, how about you, man? 
Yeah, I think the shift to the to the small screen gives the storytellers a little bit more um, freedom to tell a story that might take more than two and a half, three hours. So, you know, some of the things that, uh, and we'll use the last Star Wars movie, and I promise I won't reference it too much more than, uh, than, than that. Uh, there were a lot of things that went unexplained in that, in that movie that they just assumed that you may have found elsewhere or do whatever. Um, but, you know, stories and, uh, and series like Mandalorian, for example, they're able to take what may have been a fun two and a half hour movie if they crammed all that together. Um, it would have missed a lot of fun parts about the, the development of the storyline. Um, they're able to, to spread that out, take the time, develop characters, uh, tell unique stories and bring you know, unique elements into it. And I, I think that's just that trend's going to continue on the storytelling side of things. Yeah. Can I just say on the Star Wars front, like I'm never going to believe another word that comes out of the mouth of John Boyega or Oscar Isaac. Like both of those guys have, have been all over the news lately, just completely trashing the the sequel trilogy and listen i i trashed it quite a bit myself on this show and in lots of other places but i didn't practically beg fans to go out and buy tickets to it and then wait and milk every cent i could get out of it before telling them this sucks it's a giant pile of garbage you should have never watched it to begin with no uh, 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 uh. Nah, you already sold it to me no take backs, man. You don't get the right to sit there and talk to me about how much you hate the direction that Disney went with your character or the writers screwed up this, that, or the other. Nay, nay. Nay, nay. That's the one thing I will give to Mark Hamill. My man read the script for Last Jedi and said, well, this is a giant pile of crap. I fundamentally disagree with everything you did with my character. This is awful. And he tried to walk it back, but there was no, <laughs> there was no taking that back. People knew exactly where he was coming from, and that's exactly the way that it panned out. So screw you guys. You either take the money and smile and thank me for it, or complain out the get go when we know you're legit. But uh, but anyway, but yeah. So I I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with all of this. I really do. You know, like a lot of things in the in the pandemic era, man. People are figuring out what they can live without and what they can't. And I think there are a whole lot of people out there like us, Dave, to your point that talked about, I love to go to a movie and see that on the big screen that a lot of those folks have figured out that, you know what? It really is kind of nice just to see, Hey, this movie opened up this weekend and I can drop 18 bucks and me and two buddies are going to sit here and watch it and drink our own beer and eat our own popcorn. And look at that. I've got a 75 inch television right there in my living room with a surround sound system. This ain't half bad. Not half bad at all. I can guarantee you there's a whole lot of families that aren't sweating dropping a C-note to be able to take, you know, a, a, a spouse and two kids to the movies to buy tickets and concessions. That's about what it costs you for a family of four. One of the happiest days of my life was when I realized that I could have movie quality popcorn here at the house for less than $5 a piece. I was good. There you go. And with that, gents, we come down to White Flag. White Flag. White flag, as you know, is the segment where we just talk about what's in our radar, uh, what's on our radar for the next couple of weeks, and closing out the show. Scott, I'm going to give you a point on this, man. What are you looking forward to? Uh, Mandalorian season two. Looking forward to seeing how this uh, how this goes and uh, and turns out. So, I know what I'm doing Friday night. Yep, though I'm pretty sure that was uh, going to be one that all of us had on our list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, outside of that, you know, there's. Um, you know, football is happening. Uh, we talked about it all summer long. You know, that there's nothing quite like, you know, sitting down and watching your team play some, play some football. So I am, even though it's season is not going as well as I would like it to, I'm, you know, I am enjoying watching Florida State play football this year um, because because it's a football game. That's, you know, that's it. Um, and I want to see how these, these guys grow uh, and, and face adversity. Uh, over the course of the season, so oh, I think uh, you so, you have your answer on that. That's uh, yeah. They they don't face adversity well. They fold like cheap soup. Dave, what you looking forward to, man? What's on your radar? Uh, first of all, Scott, I don't believe you're enjoying watching Florida State football half as much as I am, sir. Just just throwing that out there. Don't be an a hole, dude. <laughs> That's uncalled for. Don't fight that shot. Don't I rub salt com- in that wound, man. I was hey. com- completely quiet. Completely quiet during your whole Miami section. I didn't say a single word. That's and, fair. and you were welcome to, sir. This is a discussionary. 
we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Now, if you, we can start out with that 50 burger we dropped on y'all this year, I'm happy with that. My my that mother always said. told me, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. <laughs> That's funny. Mine didn't say that. For some reason, it always just comes out. Uh, <laughs> I, I am looking forward to, since, uh, since Scott stole mine, I joke, we all looking forward to The Mandalorian, of course. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Tua play this weekend. Uh, I want to see what he can do. I want to see what happens with that offense. Uh, you know, I want to see what the future is going to look like. You know, we have the opportunity with the first possible high first round pick based on some trades we made. We may be in the top three again with one of the trades that we had with the, I think it was the Texans. Um, but let's see what it looks like. Let's see what Tua time looks like in Miami. Let's get a half a season under his belt and see what happens and see how he grows and goes through and what we can do for him next season. Just remember to exhale when my man takes that first major shot in the backfield. Because you know every Dolphins fan in America is going to be holding their breath going, is he going to get up? Is he going to get up? Is he going to get up? We're all going to shiver. Get up. Please get Mm -hmm. up. (laughs) We're all going to shiver. (laughs) All right, well, things on my radar, and this is not happening in the next two weeks. It's really more of a shout-out to a uh, a buddy of mine. Uh, You guys may have seen this online. My man Kevin Steverson is uh, the man behind the Salvage Title universe over at Theogony Books. Uh, I've written in a couple of his short story anthologies. Through the Gate was one of them. Uh, There was another one in there somewhere. But uh, Salvage Title Universe is, is one of those series that's really taken off and found a, a solid readership. So much so that it's been inked for a movie deal. Uh, Hideout Pictures has signed the movie rights to the Salvage Title trilogy with Kevin and the gang. And so that is going to be getting the screen treatment. I'm not sure if they're going to do uh, the full-length feature film or if they're going to do you know the television series streaming type of thing. But, uh, but that is in the works. And from what I understand, they're really keen on, on doing that sooner rather than later. So going to be a blast to see what that looks like on screen. It's a, those books are a ton of fun to read. Um, as a writer, it was a blast of a universe to write in, so I would highly encourage everybody to go check that out. Again, that's Salvage Title Universe from Kevin Steverson. Uh, you can find all those on Amazon and uh, apparently coming to a movie theater or a streaming service near you sometime in the near future. So good on everybody involved for that project. Other thing I'm looking forward to, uh, Mando Season 2, obviously, but the NASCAR playoffs are rounding to a close now. Uh, they are running as we speak at Texas, and I'm really dying to know who won. I know Harvick is down and out because of uh, NASCAR waited to throw the flag on rain on Sunday, and he hit the wall. Thanks for that, guys. Appreciate you. Uh, so he's not in it, but I am going to be interested to see who is um, who does take the win tonight because there's only one more race to lock yourself into the championship for a weekend in Phoenix. And that is going to be the weekend before my man Dave Daniels comes up to visit. And that's how I'm going to close White Flag as I get my boy to come up from Florida. We're going to throw a little cue on the grill, some beers on ice, maybe splash a little bourbon over some ice, catch a little campfire action by the lake. Wishing Brother Esther could be here, but he's got other obligations. But um, In spirit, man, in spirit. We will be thinking. He's got to hang out with his Twitter fan. That's right. Well, thanks to everybody who follows this show, listens to this show. We love all of you guys. The usual spiel, man. If you love this show, leave them reviews on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever it is you listen. We love those five stars, and so do the platforms, because that's what decides what shows get pushed to all of the other masses who may not have found us yet. You can find more about us online at dudeshyperspace.com. We're also on social media at the Hyper Dudes on Twitter. Come talk to us in our Facebook group, people. We are large and in charge everywhere across this wonderful nation of ours. And uh, whew, I'm out of breath. Looking forward to our next episode with our special guest. going to be a good time. Until then, you guys stay awesome, stay greasy, and we will see you next time on the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. See ya. See ya.